held it over for the next Sunday and more women came, so I started adding more scriptures. <laughs> By the fourth week, I had women standing out the door to hear me talk about woman thou art loose. And I didn't have a name for it. Have you ever had God do a thing in your life and you didn't even have a name for it? I called the late Archie Dennis and told him, I said, I'm teaching this class at my church and people are going crazy about it. And I started telling him about the content. He said, well, you ought to come up to Pittsburgh and do it. And I came to Pittsburgh to do it. So many people registered, he had to move it out of the church into the hotel. After a while, we were filling up stadiums. After a while, we had filled up the Georgia Dome. And over 20 plus years later, we're still packing out stadiums, praising the name of the Lord, because I believe there are some loose women in here. I don't believe that everybody came here bound to get loosed. I think somebody was loosed and they came to celebrate. Oh, bless his high name. So I'm excited about God's goodness. I've got a couple of details that I want to share with you to, to uh, day before I get down to the Word of God. One of our problems down through the years was how do we, we have over 40, 50 countries represented in here. We're translating this message into different languages as it's being conveyed. There are people who have been driving 20 hours to get here. And there are people who have been flying 20 hours to be here. I hear you, I hear you. We try to figure out how do we maintain this sense of community even when the meeting is over. And I started doing something, we started something called the Bishop's Village, which is a, yeah, some of you are already hooked up. If you're in the village, make some noise. Uh, I got some villages in the house, about half the room. We want to be able to hook up with people who think like us, who get the word like us, who appreciate the message like us. And it's 24 hour satellite right in your phone. You can get the hookup. You can get messages, ministry, behind the scene conversations, communications that would really permeate your soul. It's very simple. It's very affordable. It's very easy. And you can be a part of it. It's the Bishop's Village. And they've gotten so fancy with it now that all you have to do, if you take out your phone right now, just Take out your phone. Let me show you something. Just take out your phone right quick. I know some of y'all are scared of your phone. All you folks over 40 think you're going to punch the wrong button. It's going to blow up. I promise you it's not going to blow up. My sister and I fight about this all the time. I said, Jackie, the phone will not blow up if you punch the wrong button. You can straighten it out. Get your phone out like you're going to make a text. And it's this simple. All you have to do is text Megafest. Okay? You text Megafest. Let me get my phone. Where's my phone? Bring my phone up here. Bring my phone up. Yeah. Yeah, get my phone up here so I can see. I'm not asking you to do something I'm not going to do. So you're going to text Megafest, and you're going to text it to 555-888. Just that simple. Text it to 555-888. And once you do that, it will come, a little uh, icon will come up that will show you how you can get in the village and be a part. In fact, it was so important to us that you understand how to do this and get this right, that we hired a, a highly skilled, deeply trained professional who understands technology to the nth degree to give you a quick video of how to do this. Take a look at the screen and, and you're going to get professional training right fast in your phone. This is easy. Cost you nothing. Take a look. Hi Grandpa, hi everyone. It's so simple to join your new channel. All you have to do is you can press Facebook or you can enter your email address twice, choose your password. Mom, can I please use your credit card? Okay, I got the credit card. Time to start watching your new channel. But Mom said I have to watch her stuff first. Well, they got it in my teleprompter, but they don't have it on the big screens. Did they have it on the screens? No, I didn't think so. So whatever you just showed me, show them. Because they don't know what in the world is going on. Amen. Touch your neighbor. There you go. Hi, Grandpa. Hi, everyone. It's so simple to join your new channel. All you have to do is you can press Facebook or 
You can enter your email address twice, choose your password. Mom, can I please use your credit card? Okay, I got the credit card. Time to start watching your new channel. But Mom said I have to watch her stuff first. I hope that wasn't my credit card you gave to her. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Uh, I want to acknowledge we're blessed today to have Her Excellency, the President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Cyrus, Sir Leaf here. Would you stand and let's just uh, give a big round of applause and acknowledge this tremendous icon in the kingdom of God. She blessed our prayer breakfast. If you missed it, you missed an awful lot, and we're just having a wonderful time of fellowship. We appreciate you, and uh, thank God for you. One more time, honor her and all of the dignitaries that have come with her from Liberia. We greet you with Jesus' joy. Amen. 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 Shout hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn my heart and my attention to I think they have, uh, before I get to the word, I think they have a quick video. I don't think they showed it, a look back. And they said it's over the last maybe 20 years. Woman Out Loose is actually older than that. It started in the storefront. But it has highlighted some of the very special moments down through the years. Uh, and they may not be ready, so I'm going to talk and stall because I don't know whether they knew I was going to do that. Yeah, take a look. Celebrate you. Celebrate yourself. Take yourself out to dinner. Woman Out Loose was a Sunday school class. And at that point, that was all I thought it was going to be. I think one of the powerful things that exploded the whole Woman Thou Art Loose was, number one, a model, and number two, a male model. I was scared to death. I was horrified to walk up on a stage and open up issues that were taboo. The moment you get to the point that you cease to leak, it is a sign from heaven that God has put something down inside of you. And what started at the classroom with about 40 women in it ended up filling stadiums and domes and finally maxed out about 86,000 women. The books have been translated into four different languages, been translated into Braille, been translated into plays and music. It was a phenomenon. And watching other women come on stage and talk about the pain, to know that it's common, that it's not something that is uniquely hers. He is no respecter of persons. And what God does for one, he will do for another. When you think about all you went through. And the devil said, you're eat up with cancer. It's in your lungs. It's in your bones. But I'd get up and I'd say, you lying devil. I will not die, but I'll live to declare the word of the Lord. <laughs> if I got to be on my belly, I'm going to take it. If I got to fight, I'm going to take it. But this is my moment. This is my opportunity. Some of you don't understand why you need to shout. I know that I know that if God had not been on my side, he's delivered to me. He sets me free daily. Real spiritual warfare is when you begin to let God dig up stuff in your spirit that you never thought was there. Though you may heal in one area, there are other areas that will always need to be healed. I bind the power of the enemy. Take your hands off her. Loose that woman up. Loose her. And I hope that you walk away renewed, refreshed, and re-energized. Oh, why can't you just be satisfied? Why you got to go after? Because I can't live being almost free and almost delivered. When you come out on the other side, you're coming out stronger. You're coming out wiser. The night is a night that God pours in the oil and the wine and the salve and the healing. Because the grace of God has got me so covered. And what you feel is the overflow. Oh, and it can't be reversed. If a thousand women 
touching the green, concerning anything, his answer will be... Some of you are going to go back and preach like you never preached before. Some of you had a vision to open up a mission field to start a business. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to go back and have a baby. Somebody's going back to school. Somebody's opening up businesses. You're not leaving here until you find that purpose resting down on the inside of you. Leap into your joy. Leap into your destiny. Leap. I got rules, but I survived. I cried all night, but I survived. Somebody say, woman, down, art. My God, my God, my God. And the way, the way, the way, the way we get loose. The way we get loose, the way we get liberty, the way we get freedom, the way we get wholeness, not just for a night, not just for a weekend, but you can walk in and live in, is through the Word of God. It's preaching time. I said it's time for the Word of God. Anybody believe in the power of the Word? Shout hallelujah. I'm going to be using two scriptures. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. You don't have to stand anymore after that unless you want to leave. You may have to stand to do that. I want to pull two witnesses for your consideration. There is a thought that the Lord gave me to share with you, and I want to teach it tonight because I believe it is important to us to understand what God wants us to do as we leave this place and go into our future, what God is expecting from us. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. And we're also going to be in the book of Exodus, chapter number 15, verse number 5 and 6, 20 and 22. I'll give you a moment to find the word, and while you're finding it, I want to acknowledge my spiritual father, Dr. Sherman S. Watkins, is in the house. I'm grateful to God to see you, sir. And to all of the bishops and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists and men and women who carry the yoke of the gospel, I am honored and privileged to have you. Whether you're sitting here or there or mingled, through, mingled throughout the crowd, I greet you with Jesus' joy. And I appreciate the fact that we are laborers together with God. Amen? Here we have uh, a reading in our hearing. I, will, I really want to read Exodus first. Just, just uh, scantily read through the 15th chapter of the book of Exodus, uh, a down around a memorable moment that occurs that becomes the substratum of the Israelites' uh, experience in the Old Testament. The 15th chapter, verse 5 through 6, the deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. Then Moses, verse 22, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's go quickly to the book of Philippians and hear the New Testament witness from the word. I'm reading out of the NIV. I really like the King James language better, <laughs> but there is a phrase in which 
Uh, the NIV describes it that is so powerful and so pronounced. I just wanted to use it. The old King James language, oh, that I may know him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Philippians uh, 3.10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus have hold of me. I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Uh huh. But one thing I do, tell you that, Forgetting that which is behind. And I like the way it says it, and straining toward what is ahead. Somebody say amen. amen. Over and over, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. In the King James it says, oh, that I may apprehend that which I am apprehended of. I, I, I want to, I, I, haven't, I haven't taken hold of it yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't taken hold of it yet. But I want to take hold of that which has taken hold of me. Think about that. I want to take hold of that which has taken hold of me. I want to talk about a grip on grace. A grip on grace. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to get a grip on grace. Say it again, you got to get a grip on grace. Let's pray while we're standing. Holy Spirit, first of all, we thank you that we have arrived alive, safe and sound, by air and by land through testing, through trials, through tribulations, you made it possible. We recognize that we stand in proxy for all of those who would have loved to have been here. But you chose us. You carved out ways. You made ways. When it looked impossible, you opened doors. There are some sitting at home in a stupor right now, wishing they could be where I'm sitting right now. So I will not sit in my seat and waste the grace. <laughs> Since we have been selected to enter into this gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, I make a commitment to bless your name. I make a commitment to receive your word. I make a commitment to come into the fullness of everything you have for me. And when I get back home, things are going to change. In Jesus' name, give him the best praise you got. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, says something so startling that it has become the hinge point of every gospel preacher in the New Testament. It is startling because the Apostle Paul is largely revered by the Christian church. Without him, we would not have a full understanding of the organizational structure of the church. Christ died and birthed the organism of the church on the day of Pentecost. But it was a living, fiery thing that happened at Pentecost that had no structure, order, or definition until the Apostle Paul came and by the revelation of the Holy Spirit began to carve out things like apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors and give order through deacons and structure so that this thing that was powerful 
might have purpose and structure. It doesn't matter how anointed you are, if you don't add structure to it, you will never be effective. I cannot tell you how many people who are gifted but lack the discipline to benefit from the level of gifting that they have. The Apostle Paul becomes uh, uh, just an, a hallmark of God's power and grace for the New Testament church, not only because he is an intellectual, not only because he has the charis, the charisma to be able to command audiences of all types and levels and descriptions, but because of his history, understanding that at one time he was the, the Saddam Hussein of the Christian church, killing Christians for a living. He was so committed to his belief system that he responded to Orthodox Christianity as if it were a cult and made it his business to try to purify his community by destroying Christians. His testimony, therefore, gains legitimacy because of the atrocities that preceded it. God has a way of picking the least likely people and changing them to authenticate the fact that it is not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Many times he will step over people who have glowing backgrounds. Those people who we would have selected to choose, God did not choose. But the very person that was an enemy to everything holy and divine has now been selected to become the apostle of the New Testament church so that when God turns them around, there is no doubt as to who did it. Some of you in this building can relate to what I'm saying. If they would have told you 20 years ago that you would be sitting in here in Dallas, Texas, excited about having church and it wasn't even Sunday, you would tell them they had lost their mind. But when God gets ready to snatch you, he can pull you from anywhere, he can pull you from anything and turn you into whatever he wants to because he's God all by himself. He doesn't need a committee, he doesn't need a board, he doesn't need a vote, he doesn't need people to like you, he doesn't need you to be a nice person, a person that people would choose. I don't care if you are the dirtiest, filthiest, guttural, profane person in the world. If God sends his grace out to get you, he will snatch you and pull you in. If there's a witness in the house, clap your hands. And for the rest of his life, as you know, Paul gives his service to the establishment of the New Testament church. Very powerful, very profound in his writings, in his speaking. People came from miles around to hear Paul speak. If Paul's writings were to be taken out of the New Testament, a lot of definition would leave the church. A lot of function would leave the church. He is revered. He is powerful. He is mighty. He is anointed. He is gifted. He is so anointed that one time Paul was preaching and a man fell out of a window and died. And Paul walked down the steps, raised him up from the dead and kept on preaching. Now, you know you're bad when you can do that. Anytime you can raise somebody from the dead and not lose your thought, you're a bad preacher. But to think this man who is this anointed and this profound and this prolific and this gifted and this consecrated and this dedicated and ultimately would be martyred for Jesus Christ, offering up his life for Jesus Christ, to think that this man that gives us so much of our New Testament understanding would, would slip and confess to us that he has not apprehended. It is staggering. It is staggering especially particularly amongst those of us who hold such standards for leaders. How could he be a legitimate leader and then say to us that he has not arrived at the place he preaches about? <laughs> oh my God. How can we, can we continue to honor him seeing as we have now come to understand that he has not mastered his own ministry? And he starts by saying, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. 
Now notice carefully, he's requesting to know him, gnosko, to have a progressive, this is a Greek word, progressive growing knowledge and understanding of who he is, to evolve into the fullness of a progressive understanding of who Christ is. He says, you don't know Christ overnight. You don't climb out of the pool and fully know Jesus. Just because you bought a Bible at the five and dime doesn't mean that you're ready to teach. The reality is it takes a lifetime of walking with him to fully understand the gravity, the strength, the power. And I'm not sure even then we will understand. For the Bible says now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. The best of us, the most profound amongst us, the most scholarly, the most intellectual, the most articulate, the most prolific amongst us will not be teaching in heaven. Sell all your books down here. There will be no book tables in heaven. There will be no seminars, no breakout rooms for the elite and aristocratic scholars to share their strands of wisdom. For when that which is perfect appears, he will expose that our best wisdom was foolishness compared to what he has to say. Paul says, I want, I want to get this thing. He said, but I must confess it's not so much that he's saying that he is immoral, though he was not perfect. It's not so much that he's saying that he is flawed, though there was none good but the Father. But he says to come to, to the fullness of, of knowing Christ in the power of his resurrection, I'm not there yet. I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't, I haven't got a full grip on this. But this is one thing I do. I am committed. I am committed to whatever it takes for me to come into the fullness of a deeper understanding of what just happened in my life. Now watch this. He is suggesting to us that God does a thing that we benefit from but don't fully understand that God can bless you and you, you are in the blessing and not fully be conscious of the magnitude of the blessing. Oh, help me Lord Jesus. That God can do a thing and you can enjoy it and still be a student of the thing he did. The problem with us is that we have reduced God down to reality TV. We've reduced God down to the blood to Kool-Aid. We have people running around every day talking about what God told them. God told me not to come. God told me not to wear this dress. God told me not to buy this car. God told me not to sit on that side. God told me not to sit over. away with that. God is not running off at the mouth like a gossip column. God, his word is too powerful for him to be talking to you like that. Even Abraham, God only spoke to him a few times in his life because it takes a while to walk out the last thing God said to you. I know it's old fashioned and I know I'm going to upset somebody, but I just don't believe that God is talking to you every morning. I don't believe that God is talking to you all the way to work. I believe some of that is craziness going off in your head and you need therapy. Because whenever God speaks, something is going to happen. Whenever God speaks, things will change. Yokes will be broken. Lives will be altered. Somebody who understands it, shout hallelujah. Every now and then, God does a thing. And when he does a thing, it will revolutionize your life. Whenever God moves in your life, you will peel back for years the layers, the depth, the understanding, the magnitude of what he did. I told a friend of mine, he was going through suffering and sorrow and they had lost a loved one. And he said, why did God do this? I said, don't try to understand it. 
try to survive it. Real understanding takes time, <laughs> takes years. The old folk, I love the new stuff, but I love them old songs. The old folk said, we will understand it better by and by. God doesn't need us to understand it to move. He doesn't have to prove himself to you to move. In fact, well, God will do a thing and you might spend the rest of your life before you realize the magnitude of what he did. God could bring you to a place like Dallas, Texas. Turn your life so upside down that you would never be the same again. God can let you meet one person that revolutionized the next 50 years. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God can let you be in one building at one time, at one moment, have one encounter that would change everything you've been praying about. Your debt, your health, your body, your strength, your mind. One touch from God can fix everything on your prayer list. On your, you got a big long list. Some of you came here with a big long list of things you want God to do. I came to tell you all you need is one thing. God can move one time and fix everything on your list. Listen to this. He says, bring you all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows. One translation says the floodgates. That's a whole lot of opening, the floodgates. Heaven's got floodgates. I didn't know heaven could flood. Heaven's got floodgates. Heaven's got flood. I'll open the floodgates of heaven. Can you imagine the floodgates? Floodgates hold back tsunamis. I'll open up the windows of floodgates of heaven and pour you out. He said, I'll pour you out. The gates were plural. The pour out is singular. A blessing, I will pull you out, a blessing, I will pull you out, a blessing, I open up all of those gates to pull you out, a blessing. God said if I give you one blessing, you won't have room enough. All of your preparations are not prepared. If I pour out one blessing, you will not have room enough to receive. Touch somebody say, I just need one. That was the woman came to Jesus and said, I don't even need the whole blessing. If I can catch a crumb, oh, uh, that little problem that looks big to you, that's a crummy problem to God. One crumb from God. Fix the whole thing. One thing. One thing. One thing. One thing. One blessing. One blessing. Just need one. Just need one. I got 20 things on my list, but I just need one. I just need one. I just need one. I just need one. My sister over here might need three, and the sister over there might need five, and the sister over there might need two, but hey, Jesus, I just need one. One touch will open up everything that was blind and shut down in my life. One touch will rectify everything that's had me groaning and crying in the middle of the night. My God is so big, he don't have to touch me over and over again. One Touch everybody you can reach and say, you just need one, you just need one. You just need one. Whatever you're worried about, you just need one. Whatever the doctor said, you just need one. Whatever the IRS said, you just need one. Whatever the accountant said, you just need one. I don't care how much cancer you got, you just need one. I don't care how many bills you got, you just need one. Surely you ought to praise him up for one. Just one, just one 
touch from God. One touch. The woman with the issue of blood just touched him one touch. You just need one. I feel faith mounting in the room. I feel faith being stirred in the room. You just need one. It's not like God's got to get up and call a board meeting and meet with all the angels and plan a strategy to get you. You just need one. One touch, one word, one move, one miracle, one incident, one situation, one word, one miracle, one healing, one touch, one, 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 one. Do you hear that? For every devil, for every legion, for every witch, for every hex, for every problem, for every crisis, you just need what? And so God, after 400 years of the children of Israel praying, God decided to do one thing. 400 years, they had been enslaved in Egypt. 400 years is roughly around how long African Americans have been away from Africa. Four hundred years can bring about a lot of change. In four hundred years, you can lose your language, your culture, a sensitivity to who you are, a loss of identity. They had lost so much identity that they were no longer called Hebrews. They no longer sang their songs. They no longer worshiped their God. They no longer offered up their sacrifice. They were known as slaves. That was their identity. You're a slave. You're known by what happened to you. They cried out to God, the God that they could remember, what was left of the memories, the old traditions passed down for 10 generations, and what was left of their faith, they cried out to God to send an answer, to send grace, to set them free. And the Bible says, that Moses found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The funny thing about it is they prayed for something and when, they, when he came, they didn't like. Who they prayed for. Because when we pray for something, we have an idea in mind of what it ought to look like. And when God's answers don't look like what we imagine, if you're not careful, you will reject what God said because it doesn't look like, oh, that was for somebody. It just don't look right. It's not what I expected. Oh, you brought us out here to die. Shut up. The answer came. The answer came, the answer was born. The answer was on the hit list. The answer was to be attacked, to be sought out, to be killed. But God protected him, raised him up. And when the time was right, God sent Moses to confront Pharaoh. Give us leaders who will confront Pharaoh. I don't know whether it's age or what it is, but I'm getting tired of nice people. 
who just say nice things that they don't mean. Give me somebody who's bold enough to say what they mean and mean what they say. I'm getting tired of people whose word you cannot trust. I need somebody who will let your yes be yes and your no be no. God send us somebody with some backbone, with some spine, with some fight, with some tenacity. God send us somebody who wants power over popularity. God send us somebody who loves people more than they love crowds. God send us somebody who loves you. They come down and Moses confronts Pharaoh. He says, God said, let my people go. And after many signs and wonders, God releases him and they come to the Red Sea. This is a very important place for the Old Testament church, but it has a principle for you tonight that have come into this building that you have got to hear. Push has come to shove. They cannot be slaves anymore. I don't know, but I sense in my spirit there's some folk who came in here tonight who made up in your mind, you say, God, I don't know what I'm going to be. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what the future holds for me. But there's one thing I'm sure of. I cannot be a slave anymore. I will not leave woman out loose, bound up, tied up, stressed out, worried, nervous, afraid, can't sleep. Tonight, I'm going to break that yoke that bondage, that barrier, it's gonna go! Push has come to shove. Push has come to shove. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. God will set you in a position where you got to believe him. He'll put you in a position where you got to trust him. He'll back you up against the wall where you will find out mama can't do it, daddy can't do it, my uncles can't do it, my hero can't do it. If God doesn't get me out of this, I will not get out. I got a mountain on this side. I got a mountain on this side. I got the Red Sea in front of me and the devil is after me. God, I'm looking at you. I'm wondering, out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are in this room, I didn't come to talk to the crowd. I preach long enough that I don't care whether you think I preach good tonight or not. I didn't come to preach to the important people. I didn't come to preach to the rich people. I didn't come to preach to the cute people. I came to preach to the desperate people. I want to talk to somebody that cannot do it without God. I want to talk to somebody who's come to a point in their life that says if God doesn't do it, it will not get done. Holla at your boy! Touch everybody who hollered and tell them something's gonna happen in here tonight. Something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen in here tonight. 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 Because we're here, something's gonna happen in here tonight. Because push has come to shove. Something's gonna happen in here tonight. Because I gotta have a breakthrough. Something's gonna happen in here tonight. Because my faith is looking up to God. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. I'm sorry, nice folks. Tonight's not your night. I'm sorry, cute folks. Tonight's not your night. I'm sorry, important folk. Tonight's not your night. But I got a word for desperate people. Tonight is your night to receive a touch from the Lord. For the next 30 seconds, give him a crazy, ridiculous, I don't care what I got on. I don't care what you think about me. Holy Ghost, supernatural, praise in this place. Sit down, I'm not there yet, but I'm coming. When I get there, you're going to know it. <laughs> hey! When I get there, you're going to know it. Now the enemy has sent 600 chosen chariots to get them back. It wasn't just them that he wanted back. They had borrowed the gold and the silver the gross national product of Egypt was on their backs and on the backs of their children. There will be a shift in the money. Stop praying about it. Stop worrying about it. Stop crying about it. The wealth of the unjust. God is moving you into a position. He's just put you into a place that everything that's been tied up, not just for you, but I'm talking about generational. The Bible says that the wealth of the Egyptians was so much that the children were bent over carrying out the gold and the devil was trying to get it back. Who am I preaching to tonight? Whoever I'm preaching to, get ready for a shift in your economy. Whatever you're trying to build, whatever you're trying to buy, Whatever God told you to do, you're not going to have to worry about the money. The resources are already laid up. The blessings are already set aside. God is getting ready to, oh God, God is getting ready to blow your mind. Your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard. Neither have entered into your heart. I tell you what, it's enough. It's enough coming to you that the devil is chasing you. Let me tell you how I knew this was going to be a great meeting. We had so many problems happen right down at the end. People getting sick, other people dying, loved ones dying, going through crisis, attacking my body. And the more the enemy attacked me, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I know God's going to do something in that place. Because you wouldn't be fighting me if God wasn't going to do something. In fact, I need some sisters that will help me praise God. 30 seconds of Holy Ghost. Everybody who had to fight to get here in these last 15 seconds, give God a praise. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Help! 
touch the sister on the right and left say you got something you got something the enemy only chases you when you got something he'll only send his chariots after you when you got something he'll only try to take you down when you got something sit down sit down I'm, I'm just talking to you so what had happened was They came down to the Red Sea as slaves, but they would come out as sons. Not only was it the transference of wealth, it is the transference of identity. They would come down to the Red Sea with a master. <laughs> but by the time they got out of it, what was chasing them ended up being drowned in the way God made for them. Now listen, sis, stop being jealous, worried, contentious, competitive about anybody who's after anything that belongs to you this is a setup. What God has for you is for you. Anybody trying to get it is going to get drowned. Pharaoh was a master. Pharaoh was a bully. Pharaoh had complete control. He said who lived. He said who died. At his decree, they were killing babies. Snatching babies out of the arms of their mothers and splitting them in two. He was a sovereign ruler. He was a threatening force of evil. He was chasing them. Can you imagine the fear of a slave running from a king? Not a slave running from a deputy, a sheriff. No, a slave running from a king. Look at the oxymoron in power. Look at how much bigger what is chasing you is than how you see yourself. Look at how insurmountable this is. 600 chosen chariots. Chariots were what they used when they were going against other military forces. They were not fighting the military. They were fighting women who baked bread. Men who laid brick. They were fighting, working, ordinary, grassroots people. That's what the hoof meant, hoof prints meant. To hear the hoof prints coming was saying death is on its way. You haven't had a sleepless night until you've been up all night because you hear hoof prints. Coulda, woulda, and shoulda are chasing you. It's what the Bible calls anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. Anxious is to be scared of something that hadn't even happened. And there you are, when people get anxious and they have anxiety, they turn on each other. I was talking to President Sirleaf and she was talking to us in the discussion about what it was to lead her country during the Ebola crisis.
Ebola, that's a crisis. When people get anxious, it's hard to control them. People won't listen when they're scared. People run when they're scared. This is a defining moment. And Moses isn't sure what to do. He is looking up to God, leaders. He's looking to God to do something that God is looking to him to do. He is looking up at the heavens, saying, what? And God is saying, what is that in your hand? I don't know who I'm talking to, but you got everything you need in your hand to handle the crisis that has broken out in your life. God doesn't need to do another thing. He has fully equipped you to deal with that challenge. The enemy doesn't want you to believe in what God gave you. But the devil is alive tonight. He doesn't want you to know that what God gave you is enough to deal with what's after you. What God gave you is enough to deal with what's after you. He doesn't have to do another thing. What God put in your hand, if you would stretch it, if you would strain it, if you would get out of your comfort zone, if you would break your religious routine, what God gave you, if you would put it in a capacity it's never been before, is enough? When Moses discovered how to use what was in his hands, instead of thinking he needed something else, when, when Moses discovers the miracle of me, <laughs> that I am not limited that I am fully equipped for what I'm called to do. When God lets Moses see himself, Moses is looking at God saying, what's next? And God is looking at Moses saying, what's next? I gave you power to handle the problem. In fact, I wouldn't have put you in front of the problem if I didn't give you the power first. It's not like I gave you the problem and then said, oh God, what am I going to do? Let me come up with an answer. The very fact that you are facing the problem is a sign that I have given you the power. Who am I talking to today? If God lets you face it, and it's a problem, he puts something in your hand to give you power to deal with that problem. And God said, the problem with you is that you have not yet gripped what I gave you. You keep thinking that your gift, that your intelligence, that your relationships, that your contacts, that your influence is not enough. You keep thinking that your help is to come and your help is right here in your hand. So you are looking for me to move and I am looking for you to move. When you move, whoever I'm talking to, when you move, everything behind you is going to step into a breakthrough. When you make this move, everything that's been tied up is going to break loose. When you make this move, that's why the enemy didn't want you here. That's why the enemy doesn't want you to get this word. That's why the enemy doesn't want you to act. Because the power that releases the people is in your hand. When Moses discovered what was in his hand and he stretched it out, everything that was in his way moved because of what was in his hand. Good God of mercy. You didn't hear that. I need somebody here. Everything that was in his way moved because of what was in his hand. I'm going to try y'all. Everything that was in his way moved because of what was in his hand. Y'all ain't got nothing in your way. Everything 
that was in his way move because of what was in his hand. Slap your neighbor and say, you got enough. As soon as you grip, as soon as you grip what God gave you and stop dreaming about what God gave somebody else, as soon as you recognize the miracle of me, the power of being myself, the anointing that's on me when I flow like I flow like I flow, as soon as you believe in what God gave you, he gripped that rod and stretched it. He gripped it and stretched it. He gripped it and stretched it. And the Bible says that the waters went hither and thither, hither and thither, hither and thither, hither and thither. Everything started moving because he gripped it and stretched it. 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 You know why you're not gripping what you got? You don't believe it's enough. And it won't become enough till you grip it. It won't show you what it will do until you grip it like it's enough. It does, its power doesn't release until you grip it and stretch it. The waters parted. You know the story. I won't belabor it. The children of Israel stepped into those waters with the only identity they had was slaves. And when they stepped on dry ground and the waters were standing on either side and they went through the process of transformation, they went through the process of transition, they went through the process of triumph because all of those things are process. When they got to the other side and they came out and Pharaoh came down to the Red Sea, God held back the waters to make the enemy think that he could come through the same way. See, God has blessed you so good that your haters think it's easy. But when they try to do what God anointed you to do, oh my God, I'm talking to somebody, I don't know who it is. Tell them it's a setup, it's a setup, it's a setup. The waters that went hither and thither came back and drowned them, drowned them. Pharaoh and his horses drowned in the Red Sea. Horses drowning in the water, chariots going down in the water. The whole government system went down in the water. Everything that the enemy has built against you, the whole system, God sent me here to tell you, the entire network. Went down in the Red Sea. When Miriam grabs her tambourine and begins to beat her tambourine, you must understand the situation. Miriam is not a choir rehearsal. She's not beating her tambourine in a prayer meeting. Miriam is beating her tambourine dancing her head off while Pharaoh and his soldiers and there's a correlation between the praise and the drowning I believe that the more she praised him. 
see, some people think you praise God just because you're emotional. Some people think you praise God because of your church or your ethnicity. They don't know praise is my weapon. And when I praise him, everything that was after me drowns in the flood of my praise. I need a praise right about here that will drown a few men in the room and you can praise him if you want to but I say it's no mistake that when God got ready to drown something he called for the women because there's something about a woman that when she goes into praise touch your sister and say, sister, I got some stuff chasing me. If you help me praise it, we can drown it tonight. from that cute sister in them shoes she can't shout in and find somebody that's got something to drown. something. I feel something shifting in the atmosphere. I feel a breakthrough coming in the place. I feel deliverance coming in the room. I, I, I'm glad you stopped praising because if you didn't stop praising, cancer was going to drown and leukemia was going to drown and depression was going to drown and fear was going to drown. If you praise him again, if you, there's 
she go again. There she go again. There she go again. Father, sister that's praising God, touch her and say, drown mine too. Drown mine too. Why are you praising him? Why are you praising him? Why are you? you to see what I need you to see is what the Red Sea was in the Old Testament the death burial and resurrection of the Lord was in the New Testament so when Paul says oh that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection he's standing on the other side not of the seaside, but the graveside, having passed from death unto life, from slavery to sonship, from poverty to power. And he says, listen, listen, this is, this is what you got to get. He says, I don't have to do it. I just have to know it. Let, let me show you something. See, the problem with the children of Israel is that they were so worried about getting the promised land, they spent 40 years going after the land. They were going after the property. But the only reason it took 40 years is that, listen, it wasn't about the property, it was about their perspective. They could have gotten to the promised land in three and a half days. It took them 40 years because of their perspective. And this is what they couldn't get their mind around. I'm free. I saw it, I danced about it, I clapped about it. Yeah. But I never got a grip on the grace that had a grip on me. I never snatched it like it snatched. God sent something to get me. And I spent 40 years trying to get it. I never got a grip on the grace. Watch this. This is important. Those of you that are standing, stay with me standing. This is important. Until you get a grip on what God has done, you will remain in between places. (laughs) 
The reason they built tents in the wilderness is because they were never supposed to stay there. It was supposed to be a gateway. Listen, this is important. It was not the distance of the journey that took 40 years. It was the difficulty of the, of the, of the strangers to change their mind. God gave them something in a moment that they couldn't receive in 40 years. He gave them a freedom they wouldn't walk in. A perspective they wouldn't believe. Paul says, I'm trying to get a grip on what got a grip on me. I is not a slave anymore, master. Watch this. I'm free. Instead of just shouting about not being what I was, Here's your challenge. You got to get a grip on what you are. I'm glad Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. But that creates a problem for a person without an identity. Because my identity is tied to what went down. And if you're not careful, you will go back to what went down because you still identify yourself by what happened to you. You still talk about what happened to you. You still cry about what happened to you. You still relate to people based on what has happened and you have never gripped. When I say a grip on grace, I'm telling you that you can have degrees and still think like a tramp. I'm telling you, you can have opportunities that you kill out subconsciously. You cried out about the slavery, but you never embraced being a son. And so Paul says, I'm trying to get a grip on what God has done. If I can just grip who I am, not who I was. If you don't get a grip on it, everything you don't get a grip on, you will lose. You can be a wife, but you're gonna lose. You can be a mother, but you're gonna lose. You can be a winner, but you're gonna lose. You can be a leader, but you're gonna lose. Not because of your enemy. Your enemy went down. Except the enemy enemy I will prove to you that the only thing they had to fight was how they saw themselves the moment the man of God left them for a few days they built a God that looked like where they came from the golden calf was the Egyptians God now the Hebrew God delivered you but what you had in your mind looked like where you came from 
And whenever God shows up in a way that's different from what you had in mind, you kill it. And so the Lord sent me here on the first night to tell you that, that, that what is chasing you is not the problem. That's not your problem. Your Pharaoh is dead. Him and his chariots are drowned in the Red Sea. But if you don't get a grip on this opportunity in front of you right now, you will spend 40 years in a halfway house, living in a tent. It is not the distance of the journey that has caused the delay. It is the slowness of your perspective to change about what he gave you. So Paul is only asking for, oh, that I may know. Not that I may have, not that I may get, not that I may, no. I just want to know. And he said, I'm trying to get a grip on what's got a grip on me. If I can apprehend what has apprehended me, this second half of my life, this, oh Shabbatobo Shekedaya, this second half of my life. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. It's got, it's got to be amazing. You mean I get to live with Pharaoh dead? His chariots destroyed? And the only thing that's stopping me is for me to grip the grace. that I may know. Listen, I don't care whether you know, or 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 you know. I'm not praying for God to show you. I'm praying for God to show me. Oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering, the power of his resurrection, that he says that I may take a hold on what has taken a hold on me. I'm glad you took a hold on me, Lord, but until I take a hold on what took a hold on me, and he said, I tell you what, I may not have a grip on it yet, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to forget those things which are behind me. And look at, look at how the NIV translates. I'm going to strain. I, I want you to get up on your feet and take somebody by the hand. The person you're touching may have been mistaught that the promises of God come in comfort, but they do not. In order to walk into the promises of God, Paul says you have to strain. Exodus says you have to stretch. You think if you don't feel comfortable, it's not yours. 
I just, I'm just, that's just not me. I'm just not, I just can't, I just don't know. I don't know. I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable. I don't like it. I don't know. I got tired. It, 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 it hurt. No, 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 baby. To grip this, you're going to have to be willing to strain. You're going to have to walk into an identity for which you have no background. Freedom is scary when you've been a slave for 400 years. May have to change your name, may have to learn a new language, may have to pick up customs you lost before, may have to figure out. Nobody showed you how to be a son when you come from 10 generations of slaves. I don't know who this is for. It may only be one person, I don't care. But God wants to set you in a place that contradicts your background. You will not have the comfort of being able to refer to your fathers and fathers and fathers and say, I'm going to do this like daddy and be like my grand. No, 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 no. God said, I'm going to put you in a place that's going to be so foreign Shadabaka. Woo! It's gonna be it's going it's gonna be so weird, it's gonna be so peculiar that you're not gonna get no support at the family reunion. They're, they're not gonna understand you at the neighborhood barbershop. You're gonna be awkward yourself because you're not gonna look like where you came from. And so at first, <laughs> it's going to strain you. At first, it's going to stretch you. At first, you're going to have to reimagine yourself because it's not going to look like what you had in mind because your images are tainted by the Egyptians. And the reason I had you take your neighbor by the hand is this is a year that they're going to be stretched. Uh-huh. It's going to strain you. I'm not talking about your human efforts and your flesh. I'm talking about how you see it, how you see it, how you see it, what you know, what you think to be true. I'm talking about after 400 years of cleaning other folks' houses. You're going to be a homeowner. I'm talking about after years and years of somebody telling you what to do, you're going to be a boss. I'm talking to somebody who hadn't gone back to school for years and you're not sure you can do it again, but God is challenging you to go back to class again and, and it's going to strain you and it's going to stretch you and it's going to scare you. I had you grab your neighbor by the hand because that's the thing the master gave us to stretch with. And the person you're touching, they have to know it, they have to grip it, and they have to strain. They have to know it, they have to grip it, they have to strain. Ishabai, they have to know it, they have to grip it, they have to strain. They have to know it. They have to grip it. They have to strain. 
the person you're touching, they got to know it. They got to grip it. They got to strain. Whatever God has for you, you got to know it. You got to grip it. And you got to strain. You got to know it. You got to grip it. You got to strain. You got to know it. You got to grip it. You got to strain. You got to know it. You got to grip it. You got to strain. But if you do it, get them by the hand. This is going to contradict what happened, what was, your old church, your old point of reference, your neighborhood, your community, what your old boyfriend said, what your ex-husband said, what your oldest child said. This is going to contradict everything that reminds you of where you came from. Oh God, can you grip this? Can you grip this? Grip them by the hand. Show them how you got a grip. You got to get a grip on this blessing. That thing that's out of control in your life, you got to get a grip on it right now. That thing that's trying to destroy you, you got to grip it like that. That hurt, that doubt, that fear, that unbelief, that uncertainty, you got to grip it like that. Grip the hand again. That's how you got to grip the promise. Grip that promise. Stop playing with that promise. Grip that promise. Grip that job. Grip that ministry. Grip that opportunity. Grip, grip, grip. God said there's a grace over your life right now. There's a grace over your life like you've never seen before. And if you grip right now, God's going to fix some things. If you grip right now, if you grip right now. Okay, I got to close. I got to close. You're touching a warrior. You're touching a woman who made it to the other side. You're touching a Miriam. God brought her to Dallas to get a grip on some stuff. <laughs> Somebody's not going to be able to sleep tonight because you're going to get a grip. You're going to possess it. You gonna apprehend it. You gonna pull it to you. You've been kind of holding it, not sure it's mine. I don't know. I don't know. It feel kind of funny. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know. I'm a little bit scared. I don't know. No, you gonna grip that thing. And you're gonna pull it to you. And then like Moses at the Red Sea, you getting ready to do some stretching and some straining. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to be stressful. You're going to stretch how folks see you. You're going to strain their understanding of you. If another person comes up to me and say, uh, I'm just amazed that you're making movies I say, why? Because you're a preacher. I tell them, I'm going to strain how you see preachers. I'm going to stretch how you see black folks. I don't care how you, whatever the reason that you don't think that I'm supposed to be blessed, I'm getting ready to strain your understanding of what God gave me. Whether it's because I'm too tall, too short, too black, too white, too old, too young, too male, too feminine. Listen, strain them. Make them redefine in the dictionary what a blessed woman looks like. 
make Webster get a snapshot of you and put it in the dictionary beside blessed woman because you're going to redefine what a blessed woman looks like. It's not going to look like your mama. God said I'm going to... I got to go. Get him by the hand. You're touching a rule breaker. She's not going to fit in. She's going to strain their understanding. She's going to stretch their ideas. People have defined her by who she used to be. But God is getting ready to pull her into a brand new dimension. Squeeze her hand. Get ready for the flight. Fasten your seatbelts. You're about to take off into your destiny. Squeeze that hand. Get a grip on the promise of God. Get ready to be blessed. None of your past looks like your future. None of your past looks like your future. Squeeze that hand. I prophesy abundance. I prophesy healing. I prophesy deliverance. I decree and declare that the wealth of the unjust, I decree and declare that opportunities that will blow your mind, I decree and declare God's gonna stretch, stretch the understanding of you. Enlarge your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Because tonight, we got a grip on grace. And we won't let it go. Get them by the hand one more time. We got a grip on grace. We got a grip on grace. This is new. This is different. This is out of character. It doesn't fit the routine, but we got a grip on grace. Now God is offering you something, a chance to be who you were created to be. God did three things. He sent the flood to drown the Pharaoh so that Pharaoh would no longer be an issue. You have to reckon your issue to be dead or it'll never die. He let you attend the graveside service of your yesterday so that you could be an eyewitness to the fact that in spite of what they said, what they did, what they heard, none of it stopped you from being here. They went down and you went up. Squeeze their hand. Get a grip on that. Get a grip on it. 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 Number two, he sent the waters as a type of baptism so that not only would it be dead, but that it would be buried. That it would be over. That it would be finished. That nobody else from Egypt could come after you again. That the enemies that you see today, you will see them no more. None of the kids nor the cousins. You shall see them no more. Wait a minute, get the hand, because number three is the one I really want to tell you. But the third reason he closed down the Red Sea is the most important reason. The third reason that he shut down the Red Sea is so that when you got scared, you couldn't go back.
He said, I know I'm taking you where you have no point of reference. And you're going to have to learn how to eat food you never ate. You're going to have to learn how to sleep in an environment you never slept before. And every now and then you're going to get scared. But I shut down the Red Sea so you couldn't get back. I want to pray with people today. I want to pray for businesses that are coming out of this room, for ministries that are being birthed in this room, for missionaries that are coming out of this house, for people who are going back to school even though the devil told you it was too late. I want to pray today because you's not a slave anymore. I want to pray for people who are scared to love and scared to marry and scared to open their hearts. I want to pray for people who don't think that they're equipped to be good wives or good mothers or good sisters or good daughters. I want to pray for people who have been terrorized by past mistakes. And every time you get ready to try something, the devil lets you hear the hoof prints of your past and wants to scare you back into a slave hut. I want to pray for people who need a grip on the grace. Let me hold it. Let me have it. Let me walk in it. Lord, Hatashai. Yes, sir. The Lord told me to tell you that there's a fourth dimension to the Red Sea. He had told Pharaoh, Israel is my son. And he said the fourth dimension to the Red Sea is that the Red Sea, the water broke to the birthing of a nation. And God said, listen, God said he brought you to Dallas so that the water could break on the birthing of your new place in the kingdom. There are dreams that are going to be birthed tonight. There are people in this room that won't get any rest tonight. I'm sorry, you won't get any rest tonight because there's going to be babies leaping in your womb, ideas jumping in your head, calls to be made, contacts to be made. Right now, you cannot miss it. This is the birthing place. I decree and declare it. I bless it. I stand on it. It must happen. It shall happen. In Jesus' name. Amen. I don't want you to clap. No, no clapping, no shouting. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Listen at me quickly. There is coming a transfer. It will be a transfer of wisdom. It will be a transfer of wealth. There will come a transfer in your life that you will fulfill your vision with their resource. I'm not talking about robbing, abusing, anything like that. God is going to underwrite your vision from unexpected places. And the Egyptians who once called you slaves, the people who once thought you couldn't do it, the very people who stood and looked at you with disdain, God's gonna turn them around, use them for your glory. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I wanna pray over a seed for a dream I normally, in fact, I don't know that I have ever received an offering on opening night. I don't do that. We don't even normally receive after offerings. My staff probably is not prepared it's not on my agenda. You don't have to do it. Don't feel pressure. Don't get an attitude. Don't change your spirit. Because if you got that spirit, I'm not talking to you. 
Don't even go for your wallet in your pocketbook, just listen. What we're talking about shifting is not geography, it's mentality. What I was sent here tonight to start the process on is a revolution in how you see yourself, how you see this opportunity, and how you grip it. I'd be totally fine if the only people who sold into it were the people it spoke to. I'd be totally fine with that, totally fine with that. For somebody, this word will unlock property. For somebody, it will unlock promise. For somebody, it will unlock peace who's been wrestling and struggling with this. This is God. Why do I feel uncomfortable? It's supposed to stretch you. It's supposed to strain you. I want to bless and seal this word tonight with a seed. Before you get it, before you give it, I want to be clear. This is not a seed to me. This is not an offering to me. I know many of you would give that gladly. Some of you would not. This is not about me at all. This is about the depth of what God is saying to you that's about to happen in your ministry, your life, your career, your family, your home life, your private life. This is about a covenant between you and God because God spoke to you about something that T.D. Jakes doesn't even know about. That thing that is hard for you to get a grip on. It's hard for you to see. It's hard for you to feel like enough. It's hard for you to possess it and walk in it and get comfortable with it because of your past. 400 years of contradiction moved with one sacrifice. They killed a lamb, they shed his blood and broke a curse for 400 years. I don't know what your lamb looks like. I'm not going to name an amount. But whatever is sufficient to put on the doorposts of this opening night, put some blood on it. If you want to leave something behind that you will never see again, put some blood on it. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I want you to go quickly. You may be seated. I want you to get a seat. I want it to be a covenant between you and God. I want it without fanfare, without ceremonies, no standing in the aisle, not a lot of noise. This is a covenant between you and God. This is private. This is personal. This is kingdom. This has never happened on an opening night ever. It may not ever happen again. But I decree and declare, I decree and declare, we will grip this grace. We will grip this grace. Do they have envelopes? You got envelopes? They're passing out envelopes. If you want one, take one. You don't want one, don't take one. It's okay. No pressure, no stress. If it's not a faith, it's of sin anyway. I say, if it's not a faith, it's of sin anyway. If you don't believe it, it does nothing at all. Oh, that I may know. Those that know, know. The PMTs are in the aisle. If you know, take an envelope. If you don't know, be cool. You'll be out in a minute. Chicken wings await you. I know. Oh, that I may know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Doesn't matter if my sister knows, my brother knows. It doesn't matter what somebody else says. I know. When I get back home, I am going to grip that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody say grip that thing. When I get back, I'm going to grip it. You, it's the difference between somebody picking at something and somebody getting a grip on it. I'm going to get a grip on it. I'm going to get a grip on it. 
I'm not going to have a child I won't confront. I'm not going to be scared in my own house. I'm not going to hate going to work in the morning. I'm going to get a grip on that situation. I'm going to have peace in my house. I'm going to have peace in my house. I'm going to have peace on my job. I am not going to be afraid of my own life. I'm not going to be miserable in my own skin. Not another day. It will not happen. This is a want-to offering. It's not a have-to. I haven't been working on that book for years. I'm going to get that book out and finish it. Hallelujah. I'm going to bring my business out of my basement. I'm going to get a grip on my vision. I'm going to stop playing with it. I'm going all the way with it. I'm going back to school. It may strain me. It may stretch me, but I'm going back to school. I'm going to get a grip on it. I'm through procrastinating about my destiny. And I seal it tonight with this oath and this covenant before God. It shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done. Lickety split as quick as I can without taking up a whole lot of fanfare. If the Lord spoke to you to sow in this after offering, stand up on your feet. Whatever that seed is, is between you and God. I just want to touch and agree with you. I just want to touch and agree with you and your house and your business and your church. Why would God give me pews and not give me people? Why would God give me buildings and not give me merchandise? Why would God give me a relationship and not give me the opportunity that comes with it? I'm going to grip this grace. Why would God send somebody in my life who loves me and I keep pushing them away? Why am I doing that? Why am I sabotaging my own marriage? Why? Why why do I not grip the grace he gave me? I'm going to grip that thing. I'm going to grip that thing. I didn't survive everything I've been through to get here and not grip what is before me. Are you with me? I said, are you with me? I said, are you with me? Lift your seat up before God as we go in the covenant. I cannot tell you how many times I've been scared to death. How many buildings we rented, coliseums we built, people we hired, hired scared to death. In too deep, couldn't go back. Red Sea had closed up. Couldn't go back out there believing God. Must go forward. From Sunday school to here. Must go forward. You cannot allow your fears to entrench your promise and destroy your future. I decree and declare with you as you sow this seed today, you're saying, I heard from God. I offer up a sacrifice. I put some blood on the altar of this experience tonight. Death angel, you're going to pass by here. You will pass by here. You will not kill me or my dream. You will not kill my family or my relationships. You will not kill my opportunities or my peace. With this sacrifice, I strike blood to the altar. I strike blood to the doorpost. I strike blood to the altar. It shall be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to pass, how do we pass it to the left? Pass it to the left. Pass it to the left. Person on the left stand. Come on, sing me something real beautiful. God bless you. I love you. Enjoy the conference. Come on, sing this. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. What you've done reminded me. I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. 
what you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Whoa. I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. Lord, you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. What you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. What you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind. But now I see what you've done reminded me I am free. That's it. Free indeed. Yeah. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see what you've done reminded me I am free. Free indeed. That's it. Help me know that I am What you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. What you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I what you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Say, help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see. What you've done reminded me I am free, free indeed. Had me just where I needed. you want to be here for that as well as our general session with Pastor Cheryl Brady so be here in the morning at 8 a.m. for that also there's still time to get tickets to the comedy show tomorrow night featuring Cedric the Entertainer you can pick up tickets on Ticketmaster.com don't miss this opportunity and also don't forget tomorrow night the International Faith and Family Film Festival panel as well as the empowerment entrepreneurial sessions and the sponsorship sessions we invite you, want to encourage you. Don't miss these opportunities on tomorrow. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise your magnificent name. We thank you, Lord, for Bishop Jakes tonight. We thank you, Lord, for how you sent a word specifically for us. We thank you, Lord, that somehow you've been reading the, the hearts in our private times. And Lord, you knew exactly what you needed, and you sent it tonight. And for that, we say thank you. As we make our way back to our hotel rooms tonight, we pray, God, that you will allow us to continue to meditate on this truth tonight. That we want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Help us to grip your grace. We love you and we honor you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the people of God said amen. Come on and give God a praise tonight. God bless you. Help me know that I am free. Once was blind, but now I see what you've done.